a series of three webinars dealing with um, error proofing. So uh, today uh, we're going to have everyone um, muted. Uh, their microphones will be, uh, will be silent. However, that doesn't mean you can't participate in the uh, conversation. Feel free to use the chat feature uh, to ask any questions or make any comments that you might have. Uh, Chris Morris uh, is going to be the moderator, the keeper of the questions, and we'll see if we can't uh, answer those at the end of the, uh, the webinar. So let's go ahead and uh, jump right in. So first of all, I just wanna say thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, obviously, uh, your time is important and we really appreciate that you are spending time with us. And uh, hopefully you're going to be able to get uh, some in useful information uh, that you can use in your processes. So uh, just to let you know, my name is David Cash. Uh, I am the one of the technical application specialists at Mounts, uh, been with the company uh, for about 15 years now. I've been in the torque tool industry for about 20, and uh, I've seen a tremendous amount of applications and, and helped uh, a lot of uh, really, really uh, good customers with um, challenging and difficult applications. So, just to give you uh, some information about Mounts, uh, Mounts was founded um, in 1965. Uh, we then moved to our current corporate office location um, in San Jose. We have also uh, were the first to develop uh, the electronic torque tester for the military. We also have a warehouse, a distribution service center facility located in the Gulf Coast uh, in uh, Fo Foley, Alabama. So uh, what we're here for today uh, to talk about error proofing uh, and how we can implement that into our strategies uh, for manufacturing. Um, the error proofing or uh, poke yoke, uh, which translates uh, from English, uh, was derived from the Japanese. Uh, and I did say uh, poke yoke, not poke bowl. So. Um, I know it's getting lunchtime here on the uh, East Coast where I am, uh, so I just wanted to make sure that uh, you uh, heard me correctly. So what is uh, poke yoke? It is, uh, gives us the ability to either mistake proof or, um, prov or prevent um, inadvertent errors within uh, a given task or, uh, or process. So um, if we look at that and how that works in uh, doing um, lean manufacturing um, uh, where we're trying to be as efficient as we can um, to prevent errors uh, from from becoming larger um, that would uh, prevent um, us to be able to fully um, get the get the most out of that lean manufacturing so the pokayoki helps to um, either shape behavior or put in uh, constraints as it may um, prevent the operator or uh, prevent um, a certain type of behavior from happening. So if we look at um, what uh, the, uh, some of the principles of a pokayoki, which um, is uh, you know, a very, very uh, big um, subject, but um, if we look at it uh, with these uh, specific parameters, um, the three that I'd like to highlight would be uh, facilitation, uh, detection, and prevention. Now, facilitation allows us to be able to uh, provide um, some type of a sign or a color code or um, some instructions that help to uh, move the process along correctly. Um, now that could be uh, in work instructions or um, some other material that might help to, to do that. Detection, uh, this is where we have a process that is in place that automatically will detect when there is uh, something that, that is not correct. Um, and then prevention, 
um, which is probably our best uh, our best um, example of here of using the pokayoke is uh, making it impossible to uh, do it do it wrong. So we're actually preventing that from happening, or uh, we're preventing um, errors from happening, and we are producing the outcome that we would like to see. So when um, <clears throat> excuse me. This simple animation basically shows uh, the round, or excuse me, the round hole with the square peg. Um, and this is a really good example of uh, a pokayoki principle. So there's no way that we're going to be able to get the square peg through the uh, round hole uh, unless we get out a hammer and, and, and we start breaking things. So if we look at, at polka yoki in uh, everyday life. Um, if we look at a, uh, a car, for example, um, if we go to start that vehicle, it needs to, uh, the car needs to be in park or in neutral. Um, nowadays with keyless cars, the, uh, our foot would have to be on the brake. So these are all uh, steps that need to be satisfied before we're able to start the car. Uh, we can also see this in our uh, homes, for example, with everyday appliances that we might use that won't function uh, unless the door to that, that appliance is closed. So we can't accidentally uh, turn on the microwave without uh, uh, the door uh, being closed, uh, vice versa, uh, for safety reasons um, and for its operation. We also can see this uh, at, the, uh, at the gas pump. When we are pumping our gas, the nozzle will automatically shut off once the tank is filled, and um, it helps to prevent the gas from overfilling the vehicle. Another example um, would be elevator doors. Uh, they're designed with sensors to make sure that the doors themselves don't close on, uh, on someone to prevent uh, any type of injury, but uh, if there is sensors, do uh, detect that there is someone uh, or something in the way, the doors will remain open um, to allow that person uh, to be able to get in or get out of the elevator. So those are uh, some simplified um, examples of everyday life uh, pokayoke or error proofing um, scenarios. So when we look at uh, the assembly tightening um, and some of the failures that we can see here, um, obviously a minor fastening errors can uh, quickly bloom into very, very large problems that may, uh, that may cause a, a tremendous amount of, of work um, and additional um, financial costs. But some of those failures could be the uh, under tightening of a fastener. Uh, obviously, you have the ability for over torquing a fastener. Uh, and in both cases, this is, uh, could be a safety critical application where if uh, a fastener um, fails, uh, if it uh, shears or the uh, fastener uh, becomes loose, um, you could have some catastrophic uh, failures. And, uh, you know, basically a five cent fastener could cause um, upwards of a tremendous amount of damage uh, that, may, that may occur. So financially, um, these, this can be a problem. Um, and obviously with uh, productivity, that could be an issue as well. The amount of time that it would take to either do rework um, or create a new, uh, a new part for that specific assembly. So those are some of, kind of, of the uh, tightening failures that we may see typically uh, in an assembly process. Um, so what are, are the risks uh, as it relates to manufacturing um, and some of the challenges that, that you might see? So there's the risk of uh, improper torque control. Uh, again, we're, we're touching on the, the fact that uh, we wanna get the fastening done correctly. Um, the risk of over tightening, um, possibly the risk of cross-threading, 
Uh, also, uh, human error plays a, a big part in some of the manufacturing challenges that come into, uh, into effect with the uh, assembly process. Uh, we can also take a look at uh, assemblies that have missing screws or um, unfinished rundowns, uh, missed data uh, collection process uh, for documentation and traceability, uh, and then also making sure that tools are performing correctly, that they are in, uh, in calibration and uh, performing to the standard that they, uh, that they need to be. So let's go ahead and um, we're gonna take a, a poll question. Um, and that question is gonna, will pop up here uh, in the screen. So please just go ahead and, and take a few minutes to answer that uh, question. And we'll take a look at, at some of the challenges that, that you might see with your fastening um, uh, process and Let's see what, uh, what we get. All right, we'll just leave a couple more minutes here. Um, Chris, I don't see the results uh, coming through on, uh, on my screen. Perhaps maybe you can tell us, uh, if you can see it there, uh, what the results are. Oh, there we go. So it looks like the, uh, the uh, more or close to 50% uh, of the uh, respondents here are saying that they have issues with, uh, with over torque. Uh, and then um, the next would be uh, our under torque or lifted fasteners um, with that. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and we'll go ahead and move on. And hopefully we'll, you will be able to uh, help with some of those questions um, or help to see some solutions that we can help to, to answer those uh, for you. So what are some of the, uh, the safeguards that we can uh, use against uh, fasting failures? Now, obviously in, in today's uh, world, uh, these safeguards aren't going to help us with fastening. Uh, failures, but um, that will certainly uh, help us with our, our COVID-19 uh, uh, policies. So uh, we'll touch on that here in just a second. But um, if we can um, deploy tools that are equipped with error-proofing error -proofing capabilities, that's going to uh, help us immensely, um, give us the ability to uh, track each screw, um, the tools that were used to fasten it, um, being able to record that data, uh, store it, be able to access it uh, in the future um, for uh, any type of audit that may, that may happen. Additionally, uh, we can look at um, how we can uh, eliminate um, operator influence um, and then use a, a torque control uh, system that's going to be accurate, uh, precise, repeatable, um, and it's going to be able to give us the uh, real-time uh, monitoring that we may be looking for and have the ability to detect errors. So with that, um, we would be uh, describing basically an automa automation torque control system. Uh, now, when I say automation, I don't mean a robotic system or uh, automated in that function but automated in the way it's able to uh, monitor the tool and how it's being used. So if we look at um, a, uh, an example of this, this would be an, an all-in-one um, DC uh, torque control fasting system. Um, and what this does is it gives us the ability to be able to monitor what's happening from the moment that the trigger on the tool is pulled until the end of the uh, cycle is complete. Um, and then so all of the information that happens within those two points, we have the ability to uh, either change, modify, to track, uh, and it, it really gives us a tremendous amount of abilities to help to control, as it were, uh, the, uh, the process for um, the error proofing. 
These types of tools obviously give us the ability to have uh, multiple fastening um, strategies and presets. Uh, it allows us to be able to have sequence control uh, and, it, it do, and they do have uh, uh, built-in um, error proofing within them. So also uh, now in this, uh, this presentation, um, we're gonna slightly touch on um, how the, uh, this type of tool can help um, with uh, meeting COVID-19 uh, um, standards, um, but we will be issuing um, a survey after this presentation uh, for our next uh, two uh, seminars um, where we're gonna be touching a little bit more on, on the specific requirements for the COVID-19, um, especially in our third, uh, our third installment of this series. So um, typically what we look at when we're looking at these uh, types of tools are we have uh, a, a assembly line or a group of uh, fastening workstations. Um, and due to COVID-19, there may be reductions in force. Uh, there may be uh, social distancing um, uh, requirements that need to be met. Um, and so we are now left with uh, tools that may only have a single use that uh, maybe uh, and most likely can't be moved to another location. So there may be the need to free up uh, tools that have multiple presets and the ability to do uh, a multiple different fastening strategies. So again, if you're uh, in a situation where um, the, there's decreased worker density um, due to restrictions uh, placed by uh, the powers that be, um, and you need to decrease workstations, but you still need to uh, keep the same production, um, you may need to look to these types of tools to be able to satisfy those types of uh, those issues. <clears throat> so uh, when we look at, at air proofing um, and the requirements that, that come with it, um, if we can add uh, layers of uh, air proofing on the assembly process and that gives us the the best ability to help prevent any type of error that we would be seeing. So if uh, we have three or four layers uh, and one of those layers is not completed correctly, then that entire rundown would then be rejected and, and we would see uh, an error notification to the operator. So with that, um, that is a kind of the best scenario that we can implement um, and the, the strategies that we can use. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and uh, we're going to run through uh, a little bit of a, a demonstration process. Now, I'll be using our uh, DC tool, uh, but these principles should um, and may work uh, with others um, if you have, uh, have those as well. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll take a look at uh, four different scenarios. Uh, one um, that is a very easy type of uh, scenario, um, and then we'll move to um, add additional layers to that um, on how we can go ahead and error-proof the assembly process. So. so in scenario one, uh, we have a situation where the operator, um, in some cases, doesn't completely uh, finish the torquing operation. So it may be an example of a high production um, environment where the, the operator needs to finish uh, their assemblies in a rapid, rapid pace, and they may not completely wait for the tool to uh, finish its cycle uh, and completely torque. So what are the, some of the things that we can do um, to be able to help uh, satisfy the requirement for that specific scenario? So let's go ahead and, and take a look at our uh, tools here. Um, what you'll see uh, on the screen here is I have um, our uh, MDC uh, unit, and then I have our, our tool um, over uh, on the other screen that uh, 
so we can kind of see what's happening during the, the simple processes. So to be able to uh, ensure that the, the customer, or excuse me, the operator is completely using the rundown, there are a couple parameters that we can use on our controller. The first would be giving the ability for the operator just to simply hit the trigger, and then once the trigger is pressed, the operation begins. And so for us to be able to do that, I simply log into our system, and I go to our controller panel. And then on our uh, page here, we have our trigger start. So I simply turn that on. Now we can roll uh, back out to our operation screen. And then um, as I apply uh, any type of, oh, excuse me, <laughs> as I, as I uh, hit the trigger on the tool, the, the tool will then operate and it will run um, until uh, there is an error or the fastening is complete. So uh, in this case, uh, we have an error uh, because we have a specific uh, runtime limit um, set on this tool um, right now. So that's one way that we can overcome, uh, overcome this. The other method that we could use um, would be to implement a, an actual error if the operator releases the trigger before the operation is complete. So this is kind of a behavioral change. So I'm gonna go turn off the trigger uh, start function and I'll go back over here to our fastening stop error and I'll turn that on. And what that will do, as I mentioned, is if I apply load or uh, go ahead and hit the trigger on the tool, and if I let go before the operation is complete, we get a error uh, that's a no torque. So uh, for this to be able to function correctly, let me go ahead and just make adjustment here so you can see the thread block. And dial in that focus there. So there we go. So in this case, if I were to run down a fastener, uh, we would go ahead and get an OK. Um, if I'm in the process of running down a fastener and I let go, then we would get our no torque complete. So that would be kind of a very uh, easy and simple solution uh, to prevent the operator from not uh, letting the tool complete its cycle before we move to the next, uh, next fastening operation. So our next uh, scenario uh, for number two is going to be uh, giving us the ability uh, to properly count the number of fasteners in a specific assembly. So in, in our example here, we have uh, I, it's, uh, four or excuse me, three fasteners um, in our assembly. And we need to make sure that uh, all of those uh, get uh, assembled. So uh, for us to be able to get feedback from the controller, uh, we can go ahead and use a screw count function uh, or in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and use a model function um, on our controller. And what this does is it allows us to be able to use different presets for uh, different uh, predetermined uh, fastenings within that specific preset in that assembly. So uh, I'll touch on a little bit more of what it can do uh, when we take a look at, at the model um, itself in the controller. So if we go, into our menu and we look at our model, uh, we have basically 20 uh, different steps that we can do within a specific uh, model. Uh, we do have the ability to have 15 different models in the, uh, in the controller. 
And within those 20 steps, we have the ability to do a fastening process. Uh, we could also communicate with uh, some IO devices, either a PLC or uh, some light trees or pneumatic actuators um, or other safety critical components that we may need to implement. But for this case uh, and this example, we're gonna keep it very simple that we're just going to have uh, one fastening step we're gonna use preset one, and there's a count of four fasteners. So for us to go ahead and uh, switch our uh, controller from our preset mode to model mode, I just need to go into the controller and make that adjustment. So we have our model selection mode. I'll turn that on. And then we log back out, um, and now we're in the model mode. So I wanna use model one. Um, again, this gives us a count of four fasteners, and uh, our torque value is here, uh, and then we do have uh, still our fasting stop error um, on, the, on the controller. So if I just run down four fasteners, and on the last one, There. So now our model is complete, and then we get that signal uh, to the operator, letting us know that, yes, indeed, we did hit all of the fasteners that, that we intended to fasten. Um, at this point, uh, we now can have the, the model communicate, uh, again, like I said, with a PLC or some line control to move that part out, uh, bring the next one in. Um, it can get uh, very, very complex, um, and again, this is just a simple, uh, a simple view of, of that. Um, now, for our next uh, scenario, this is going to be uh, an example of where we have the ability to actually monitor uh, the amount of angle a fastener rotates, so we have uh, our torque that we're monitoring, and then we can also monitor our angle. So this is really important um, for our fastening to help prevent any type of cross-thread errors. So in a, a cross-thread situation, uh, the fastener would cross-thread uh, right at the beginning of the fastening, and we would see that uh, torque would be, would be reached. However, the amount of rotations that it would take to normally seat the fastener would not. So we would get, we would see an error in that situation. So uh, we're monitoring the torque and then we're also monitoring the angle. Now um, in, a, in a strip screw scenario for this, uh, we would see um, the opposite. The, we would not hit the, uh, the torque because uh, the fastener would simply be, uh, or excuse me, would be stripped and we would exceed the uh, maximum angle that would be allowed. So, we have the ability to uh, monitor a, a minimum angle and a maximum angle, and we can make that window uh, whatever size that we would like, depending on the application. Um, there are ways that we can monitor, or excuse me, we can determine the amount of angle that is typically in the rundown, and then we can go ahead and make adjustments there. So in this scenario, um, we have a, a, a gasket type uh, scenario where the, the part needs a gasket um, or the assembly screw needs a gasket. If a gasket is not present, we could have a failure in the, in the uh, assembly. So for us to be able to make sure that the gasket is there, we're going to set our angle um, to meet uh, at a minimum threshold um, and our, our, excuse me, a maximum threshold. If it exceeds that, then we will see uh, an error. So Let's go ahead and, and take a look at the assembly. On uh, the screws here, let me just sign a little more light onto the thread block so we can see that a little bit better. And I'll zoom into just a little bit. So if you could see here on these, uh, these fasteners, 
can make the adjustment to this focus. Okay, so uh, we do have um, our gasket material um, on this fastener here. Um, we have it on the second fastener, and then we also have it, or uh, we do not have it on our third fastener. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and we'll change uh, our model here to model number two. And this is going to uh, monitor uh, basically the amount of uh, angle and we can take a look at what that looks like in our uh, fastening menu. So for, for our model number two, uh, we see we're using preset number three uh, and the count is at three. So in our fastening preset, if we look at the third preset, we can see that our, our maximum uh, torque angle is, uh, is 2400 uh, degrees of rotation. So as the fastener turns, if it turns more than 2400 degrees of rotation, then we're going to see an error. Um, and without the gasket present, uh, we should expect to see that. So Now that we're here on, on model two, we can go ahead and uh, run these, these fasteners down. Let me just make another adjustment to the camera. To make sure that we get a clear picture of that. All right, fantastic. So uh, in our first example, uh, we have hit the, the torque value uh, and we didn't exceed the amount of angle that would be needed. Same again for our second fastener. But if I fail to put the gasket in, now the, the fastener itself did not uh, fully seat um, and we did get our, our error. So for us to be able to finish out the model, And now we have a model complete um, and we're now back uh, to, to the beginning of that <clears throat> specific cycle. So in this, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> in this scenario, we were able to monitor the uh, amount of max maximum angle um, that would be affected if it needed to monitor a gasket type um, application. So now uh, let's go ahead and take a look at our fourth scenario. And now this scenario would be uh, an assembly process that um, has a, a number of different um, presets or uh, torque values that it, it may be using. Uh, it also could be uh, maybe the same fastener uh, torque value uh, the same uh, fastener uh, head size, but the, the length of the fasteners uh, could be different. And in being able to uh, fully assemble uh, this type of assembly, uh, we can do that in basically a sequence that would allow us to be able to control which fasteners we are using uh, and be able to monitor those within the sequence. So. For example, if we were using, um, in our scenario here, we have uh, two different uh, torque values, we have two different uh, fastener sizes, but in order for us to properly seat the assembly, we need to uh, do two of each at a time to properly seat. So we will do two of one uh, preset, two of another preset, but the sizes of those fasteners are different. So we wanna make sure that we don't see an error with the operator being able to not use the correct fastener in the correct location. So let's take a look at what that scenario is. So oh, hold on one second, let me go back. 
There we go. So now in, in this example, we'll use our, our models again. And if we look at, at model three, It's basically giving us the uh, ability that we're using uh, preset two for a count of two, preset four for two, and then back preset two uh, for two, and then four for two as well. Um, so now these fasteners are different lengths. So for us to be able to monitor that, if we look at those specific presets in, excuse me, in preset two, we're gonna be monitoring um, our angle and we can't exceed uh, 1300 degrees of rotation. So this is our smaller uh, fastener um, and uh, anything outside of that, uh, we'll see uh, an error that would happen. Now we don't have a minimum um, on there because this is our, our smallest fastener, however, We'll see that in our next example, if we look at preset number four, and we look at um, our minimum angle is gonna be 1300 degrees, and then our maximum angle that we can go would be 2000 degrees for that specific fastener. So with that, if we go ahead and commence that model, and just to give you uh, uh, a little bit of explanation on the screen here, um, it is showing that we're in model number three, we're using preset number two, and we're in step one, which is a fastening uh, step that we, we are using. So for these, <clears throat> excuse me, in, uh, let's see, make sure the camera can see it. All right, perfect. So we're now using uh, preset number two, and we'll go ahead and run that down. And we met the requirement. Again, now our model has changed now to preset four. And we're on step two, which is our fastening step. And now we have uh, our exceeded angle, uh, our 1300. But if we went and we were tried to uh, do one of the smaller fasteners in the large location, then we would see our minimum angle error. If then we came back and we hit the, with the correct fastener, uh, then we would be able to move on to our next step. Uh, and the same thing would happen. Now I let go of the trigger and we had our no, uh, no torque up event. Uh, but if we do finish completing our step three, which is our first torque value, uh, and then come back and we had basically a strip fastener. Now we've exceeded the amount of angle uh, that we could use. So that is um, how we can use uh, angle detection in a multiple sequence type of fastening event where we can uh, monitor uh, two or more different torque values uh, or presets within a given assembly. And again, with the models, uh, we do have uh, 20 steps that we can use. And again, there is IO communication between that um, if that's needed. Uh, but that's a whole different, uh, a different webinar um, and subject. So with that, that brings us to uh, our question and answer uh, section. Uh, so let me get a drink of water and then uh, if Chris, uh, if you'd like to bring on the questions, we'll see what we can do uh, as far as being able to answer any of those that, uh, that may come up. All right, Dave, can you start the tightening process in reverse and what application is it typically used for? Uh, it could, you can certainly um, start the, uh, the application in reverse <clears throat> um, if you had, it, had a left-handed thread. <clears throat> um, we do have that ability to control uh, the direction uh, in this specific tool. Um, 
it could um, be used also in maybe a heel coil insertion application, although uh, that's typically just a run in and, and run back out type of, of scenario. But uh, yes, the, the tool itself can be programmed to be able to run in the, in the reverse uh, as its forward position if needed. Thanks, Dave. When seating a fastener, can you slow the tool speed down and why would you deploy that uh, type of application? Yes, as I, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning um, with uh, the introduction of the, the DC tool, um, we do have that ability to be able to, uh, let me jump on the screen here. We do have that uh, ability to be able to monitor uh, that situation. Um, now typically uh, with uh, a, a DC tool, um, you want to be able to use the uh, RPM that's going to be correct for the torque that you're using. Now, um, in this scenario, I have a, uh, a very uh, light torque that I'm using um, in this example, uh, and the RPM can be quite slow. Uh, because we, if we're using um, a really fast RPM at a low torque value, the inertia that's generated from the tool when that shuts off um, could move us into an, <clears throat> excuse me, an over torque type of situation. So um, it's best to use uh, kind of an RPM that may be slated for uh, that specific torque range. However, if you do have a, uh, a longer fastener or you want to be able to maximize the ability uh, to be able to uh, efficiently run down a fastener, um, we do have the ability to uh, have a uh, free run uh, time, which is basically an angle setting where we can run the tool at its full power and for a certain amount of rotation or degrees. And then we can go ahead and shift the tool back to the automatic RPM just before it's about ready to seat. So we get the, uh, the ability of, uh, of both worlds of being able to run um, at a very fast, um, high RPM but also maintain uh, torque accuracy, especially at a low torque type of uh, fastening event. So uh, we do have that, that function that is uh, available um, on, our, on our tool. All right, thanks Dave. Uh, next question, can this tooling system be used for fastening thread cutting screws? Uh, it, it, certainly, it certainly could. Uh, you just want to make sure that uh, the torque that, uh, that you're using or needing to cut um, obviously meets within the requirements of the tool, but you can certainly do that. Um, you can uh, set up uh, angle requirements um, with that thread cutting. Um, you do have the ability, uh, as I showed in this one, we were mainly focused on uh, torque control with angle monitoring. However, we can go ahead and reverse that scenario where we can run the fastener to a certain amount of turns or a certain amount of degrees of rotation. Uh, and then we can also monitor to make sure we're, we're within a specific torque window um, as well. So uh, that's kind of a, a nice function of, of our tool is that we can run it in a, a torque monitoring, or excuse me, a torque control mode with angle monitoring, or we can run it at a angle control with uh, torque monitoring. All right, thanks, Dave. Can a barcode system be used with this? It sure can. Um, you can use the barcode to be able to uh, pull up uh, specific presets or uh, pull up a model. You can use uh, specific barcodes to change um, uh, the scenario or, or if a part comes down, uh, you have the ability to add a, a barcode or, or serial number to a data capture event that happens with this. So a barcode certainly can be used uh, with this tool. All right, thanks Dave. That's all the questions we have. All right, fantastic. Well, I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that we do have uh, two more installments uh, of this uh, webinar series on error proofing. Uh, we're next uh, is on June 4th uh, at the uh, scheduled time here, same uh, at 12 uh, Eastern Pacific time. Uh, this will be looking at um, another uh, way that we can error proof, uh, not with just a DC tool, but um, how we can use uh, another device to do that. 
again, we'll have another uh, one where we'll kind of culminate the uh, use of all of the, the different uh, uses of the air proofing systems that, uh, that, we'll, that we'll be demonstrating. And then we'll also uh, touch on a little bit more on the, uh, the COVID-19 requirements as it relies uh, or as it relates to uh, the assembly process and manufacturing um, in general. So with that, um, I would like to say uh, again, a big uh, thank you for uh, everyone that uh, uh, attended and participated. Um, this webinar will be recorded uh, and distributed um, and sent out to uh, all of the attendees and should be available also uh, via social media, either through Facebook or YouTube uh, as well. So with that, thanks very much. Have a great day and we'll see you soon.